Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for the happy birthday. Uh, this week was a quiet week around the office, so I actually thought I was going to get away with it. Um, I'm not a huge birthday celebrator, but I'm thankful that I'm in a church that does celebrate birthdays. And my wife, who I guess has taken the baby out, uh, she's a big birthday celebrator. But this week, Trudy came up to me, and Trudy does our family ministries, and she said, does everyone know it's your birthday? And I said, no. Uh, or actually, I, I'm pretty sure I lied. I said, yeah, yeah, they know. And she said, well, should we, are we going to do something? And I said, no, no one's got anything planned. And, and she said, well, but do they actually know? And I said, sure, it's on the calendar. And she said, is it? And I said, yeah, absolutely, it's on the calendar. I don't think it was on the calendar. I just thought, let me get this, you know, swept under the rug. So I turned 39, so the big 3-9. Uh, so next year, 40, we're just going to skip a Sunday service and just have a big party. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, so let's get into what we're talking about today. I'm so happy that we get to talk about some of the tough topics that we all deal with. Uh, it's been a real mission of mine that I want to make it easy for you to invite people. I want to make it easy for people to come and to receive something here that maybe will help their life be better or will help them to just deal with the world out there. So the last couple of weeks we talked about suffering. We all suffer. We all know what it's like to suffer and go through some suffering. And we had a lot of really great feedback from those two messages. Messages. And so that just really warms my heart. I, I read an email this morning from someone that wrote just kind of a miracle story about that. And I thought, man, it's so good to see God work. And so because of that, I'm extra excited because we're talking about mean people and what to do about them. And I know that we all have mean people in our lives. In fact, when I say mean people, there's probably somebody that comes to your mind. I know for me, it's Sonia and Talani in the band because they made me sing happy birthday for my birthday today. They come to my mind. But for, for real, it's not actually them. I'm thankful for them. But for, for all of us, somebody comes to mind. And as I was preparing for today's message, I had like a list of 10 people in my mind of like, man, this is that person. This person is so mean. This person was mean to me here or mean to me there. But we've all dealt with this. So whether you believe in Jesus or not, whether this is your first Sunday or your 100th Sunday, regardless of what it is, we all have encountered a mean person in our lives. And it's important that we talk about what to do about them. So this is not just a, a message on mean people and, and telling you how other people are mean and how you don't deserve to be treated mean. No, this is a message about what to do about them. So what are you going to do about people? What are you going to do about people that are mean in your life? See, it's important that we know what to do. It's important that we have a bit of a plan. In fact, if, if you don't have a plan for dealing with mean people, then what's going to happen is they're going to gain a, a measure of control over your life. So let me repeat that for you. If you don't have a plan for dealing with mean people, they gain a measure of control over your life. And, and we all know that to be true. When you deal with a mean person, how much time do you spend thinking about them? How much of your thought space do they occupy? How much of your personality do you alter when you're around them? How much do you kind of change who you are to fit a certain mold so that you don't have to deal with this person being mean to you? Or maybe you have a mean situation at work or a mean situation in your family. But the point is, is that if you don't deal with it, then it's going to have a measure of control over your life. And now for a lot of us, you know, myself included, you can probably think right now that there's somebody or there's some situation that has some control over your life because it has to do with somebody who is mean to you or somebody who is a bit mean. That's why we have to talk about this because I don't want to, I don't want to leave you here. The, the other reason that we have to talk about this is because hurting people... see. I have a statement here for you. Hurting people because they hurt you. Hurting people because they hurt you. It's a tongue twister, so I thought, well, let me put it on the, on the screen for you. Hurting people because they hurt you does not end the cycle. We think that if someone hurts us and I hurt them back, then I will get back at them and this hurt cycle, this mean cycle, will be over with. But it, it doesn't work that way. Instead, it perpetuates it. And in fact, it makes you like the person that you dislike. So what that means is you don't like this person that's being mean. And so you think of ways to get back at them that are probably mean. And so now as you think about dealing with this person that's hurt you, you're thinking of ways to hurt them. And you're just perpetuating this cycle. You hurt them, they hurt you. 
then you hurt them back, and then they hurt you deeper. And you go deeper and deeper and deeper, and at the end of the day, you end up becoming just like this person that you don't even like. You're just like them. And we don't, we don't want to do that, and I don't want to leave you guys there. So there's a better way to deal with it. But first we have to look at what are the effects that a mean person has on your life. How, how does a mean person impact you, or what kind of effect do they have on you? So I've, I've got two things. Because of mean people... Because of mean people, we can't be who we are, so we overcompensate, and we be someone different. So because of a mean person, we overcompensate. So, so what does this mean? It means you change your personality. Like, you fundamentally change who you are. It's, I can't be myself around this person, because when I am, I've been punished by the way they treat me, by the way they talk to me, by the way they act around me. This person is just, it's, they're, they're mean to me, they're hurtful to me, they've hurt me, and so therefore I have to change who I am. I have to overcompensate. So I have to take these qualities about myself, and I have to diminish them, and then I have to maybe increase these other qualities, because everything that I'm trying to do is to prevent this person being mean to me, and me experiencing the hurt that they portray on me. And, and that's, that's kind of a sad state to be because you were created with beautiful personalities and beautiful identities. But why is it that we, we overcompensate and we change those? We pull those in. We cover them up. We, we hide one identity here. We expose it there. We kind of become different people. It, and there's an easy way for you to know if you do this. If you do this in your life, that means that you're one way with one group of people and probably another way around another specific person or another specific group of people. So there, there's not just one version of you. Because based on who you're around, you're overcompensating and undercompensating. You're, you're, you're becoming a different person. Now, another effect of having mean people in your life is, is this. Because of, of mean people, we become consumed inside and out. We give away all of our headspace real estate. Now, this could not be more true for me. I don't know how many of you like to argue in the shower. And I don't mean argue with another person, but you argue with, with a situation in the shower. You know, I've, I've, I've been so mad and I've argued so hard in the shower that I've thought that I washed all the hair out of my head because you're just sitting there, you're thinking, I'm going to get back at this person. This person's not going to do this to me. This person deserves something really bad. This person just doesn't deserve what they're, what to, they don't deserve to have what they have. You know, I'm going to take their business away or their, I'm going to take this away from them or I'm going to turn them into their family or whatever it is. But, but you, you have all this headspace, this real estate in your mind that could be thinking about good things. You could be thinking about how beautiful the day is outside, but instead you're walking around thinking about how much you hate somebody. You could be thinking about how wonderful it is that, that you wake up with air in your lungs and you have you know, a nice house or a nice family or whatever it is. There's food on the table, but you're not thinking about that. Instead, you're thinking about this person that has consumed you from the inside out. Now, I've got, I have so many stories about this. One of them was when Casey and I lived in White River. So I don't know, do we have any people here that are from White River? I would love to have just had somebody say, "Woo!" you know. I'm like, you're coming over for lunch today. Now, it's a, it's a small little town outside of Nelspray. And uh, when we lived there, I was doing a lot of running. And there was a great trail system there. And so I would go run these trails. And, and we, we had some people in our life. And we had a business that lived across the valley from us. And they were just owned by a mean person. It was a bar. And they would just party late, late, late at night. And when we would ask them to turn the music down, you know, they were just mean. They were inconsiderate. And I would go and I would run, you know, an hour, hour and a half a day, five, six days a week. And I started to realize that I was giving this person, this business, six, seven hours a week of just focused real estate in my mind because the whole time I was running, I'd be like, God, I hope you just, there, all the beer kegs explode and the power goes out and, you know, I hope that, you know, some underage drinker gets sick there. And then you start thinking like all these, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, who in the world am I? Why am I thinking these thoughts? What in the world is going on? You know, we, we've had uh, because we're renters, we've had the, the joy, see, because we're, we're American, so for those of you that are new and you're wondering why I sound different, it's not because I'm from Limpopo or somewhere else, it's because we're from the States, but it's, it, that made me forget where I was going with this, 
as I thought about, I thought if I've offended someone from Limpopo, then, you know, that's a shame. Oh, I remember where. Yeah. So it's hard for us to buy a house here because we have to have so much money down uh, because we're foreigners to buy a house. So we've just been renting. And in the process of us renting, we've encountered and uh, we've had some amazing homeowners that have, have rented to, to us. We had an amazing couple. Uh, it was a couple houses ago that rented to us. And they just they prayed for us and they loved on us. And it was such a gift. But we've also had some really mean people. And there was a, a really mean person that we rented from that, that just absolutely wrecked my soul because I started to realize that every day, day in and day out, almost 24-7, I was giving so much headspace, so much emotional and mental real estate to this person that they had completely consumed me. And then you kind of, you kind of like lose your identity in your situation. So I don't know how many of you can identify with that, but probably everybody. You know, and when you sit in traffic on the way to work, you may be thinking about this. And see, we... we, we this is such a personal offense to us because we think, wait a minute, this is not the way society should work. This is not the way relationships should work. I should not be treated this way. I should be treated better. I should be treated differently. And we get that idea. You know, we're even taught that from a young age. And there's this thing called the golden rule. And this is what we hope people uh, would apply this rule to us and we would apply this rule to them. But it doesn't get done. So do we know what the golden rule is? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. So that's you taking some accountability and saying, okay, I'm going to do to other people the way that I would like for them to do to me. I tried this one time. I walked around and I gave out $100 bills thinking that someone would give me $100 bills back. And it didn't work. Nobody did unto me. I, I did unto others as I hoped they would do unto me. But it, it was, that was a one-way street. But, but the, the point is, in all seriousness, is that we, we, th this is a beautiful idea. I mean, it really is, and we teach our kids this, and we hope that we live by this, but if everybody prescribed to this, there would be no competition in business, there would be no fair market pricing, there would be no, there would also be no crime, there would also be no hate, that it would be this weird utopia society where everybody was just nice to somebody else because they were hoping they'd be nice to them. I mean, I would love for this to be what governs our culture and our society, but it's just not. And you know that it's not this way because in the morning, if you get on the N1 and you're trying to merge into lanes and you think, why won't this person let me over? My blinker is on, I obviously need to get over. And they just, they speed up and they stay next to you. They won't let you over. And you think, man, I... <laughs> This do unto others as, as you would have them do unto you. This isn't fair. And then when you finally get into the lane and somebody tries to cut over in front of you, you're like, ah, no, no, no. No, I fought blood, sweat, and tears to get in this lane and you are not coming over. See, this is how quick this goes out the window. It happens in traffic on Monday morning. And so what, what I thought is, okay, if the golden rule doesn't work, there, there's another rule that, that I have for us and it's called the silver rule. And so the silver rule is to do unto others as they have done unto you. So do unto others as they have done unto you. So now you're walking around kind of like the police where you're doing to other people the way that they've treated you. So now I walk around and I get the ability to treat other people the way they treated me. So if you were mean to me, I get to be mean to you. If you were angry at me, I get to be angry at you. If you were upset with me, then I get to be upset with you. You know, if, if you didn't wash the dishes, then I, guess what? I'm not cleaning the kitchen. It, it's, it, we see this in our relationships. We see this in business. We see this in work. But this is the silver rule because it's not quite as nice as gold, but it's kind of more accessible. More of us have this. It works better on more of us. More of us are, are much more comfortable wearing this rule on ourselves. And it's do unto others as they have done Unto you. Now, the third rule that I want to talk about is I've, I've called this the iron rule. And the iron rule is to do unto others as someone else has done unto you. See the difference there? The silver rule is do unto someone else what they've done to you. The iron rule is do unto someone else as what someone else has done to you. So because my friend has hurt me, I'm now going to take it out on my other friend. Or because I grew up and my parents were abusive to me, I'm now going to take it out on my children. Or because at work somebody took advantage of me, 
then I'm now going to go home and I'm going to take it out on my family or I'm going to take it out on the dog or I'm going to take it out on whatever it is that you decide to take it out on. But this iron rule is the one that many of us actually live under. This is the one that the majority of us actually live with. I'm going to do to someone else something because of what someone else has done to me. So I, I just want to pause in this moment in the message and let this sink into you. Are you doing something to someone else that may be mean or unfair or emotionally manipulative or whatever it is, but are you doing something? And can you pause for just a moment and think, is it because they've done something to me or is it because of this whole someone else? Because someone else has got so much space in your thought and they have so much control over you and they've consumed so much of your thinking that now you're, you're not even maybe aware of it, but you're acting out for other people based on what this other person has done in your life. So that, that's what I hope that we get freedom from today. And, and we're going to continue to talk about it next week, and I hope we get even more freedom from it. We're going to learn how to handle mean people so that we can stop living by these rules here. So now I'm going to tell you exactly what to do with mean people. This is you know, get ready, take notes, what to do about mean people in your life. The first thing that you can do is you can get even. Okay, now that's a joke. We can't get even. I, sometimes I just want to know if you're listening. So I put stuff up here. No, so we talked about this a little bit earlier, but when you get even with somebody, you become even with them. So why would you want to get even with a mean person? Because then you become a mean person like they are. Why would you want to be like someone else that you don't even like so why do you repeat the same behavior that they're doing to you why do you repeat it back to them well part of it is because it feels so good I'll never forget uh, I'll, t I'll tell you another quick story we were on a walk at um, uh, where where is we were on a walk at Newlands Forest and we had the whole family this was when it was just me and Casey and Leafa and I think someone else may have been with us, but we went on this walk, and you know that there's dogs running around everywhere, and this person, we'll just call them a person, a human being, had a bunch of dogs with them, and one of their dogs actually like bit at Leafa. And, and I got, obviously, you know, I puffed up like the dad and the protector, and I got mad and, and yelled at them, hey, you need to put your dog on a leash, and they still wouldn't put the dog on a leash. And then I guess because they heard my accent or this or something, they said, this is Cape Town. You don't even belong in Cape Town. And here our dogs have the right of way. And I thought, I cannot believe that you just put your dumb dog over the, you know, in value over, you know, uh, my child. Come on. And so... As we're walking off the trail, I'm immediately consumed. I hope that dog dies tonight. I hope somebody runs it over with a car. And I'm just consumed with just anger. I'm like, I'm like vibrating. I just want to get even. And I'll tell you what, this is one of the moments where I know that God loves me. We walked into the parking lot. And as we walk into the parking lot, a police car pulls in. And I think, Lord Jesus, you love me. You love me so much. I walked up to the officer and I said, officer, my child was attacked by a dog. And he's like, his eyes got big. And I said, it's that woman right up the trail there. And I got in the car and I told Casey, I said, we've won. <laughs> won. One time. I got it. One time we were able to get it. I got even. But you know what? That doesn't get me anywhere. Now I'm just a, a miserable person, just like this lady was who was like, no, you don't deserve you know, to be here. And said, my dog has more rights than you. You know what? It felt good in the moment to get even, but it didn't actually make me feel even. It didn't make me feel good. And you know what? It kind of just also hurt, hurt Casey and it hurt Leafa. It's like them watching me celebrate because, you know, I got to turn a woman into the police. This doesn't work. It feels like it will work, but it does not work. Now, so the, the next thing that you can do about mean people in your life is, is you can ignore them. Now, this is something that, Obviously, this is not what we're teaching today, but it's something that we do. We think, I'm just going to ignore this person. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore them. I'm not going to acknowledge them. I'm not going to have anything to do with them. I'm just going just gonna to ignore them. And you know what? That also doesn't work because then they just 
take more of you and they take more and they take more and they become more mean and then more mean and then you just give more of yourself away and you keep giving more of yourself away but inside you start to build this bitterness you start to build this resentment so you may outwardly be ignoring something but on the inside something is it's building it's building it's building it's building and it starts to really shape you into somebody that you maybe don't want to be you don't consider yourself to be so we also can't do this And so what what I'm actually going to give you, I've got, at the end, we're going to talk about four questions. And these are four questions that you can ask yourself. There are four questions that that you can teach your kids. And I'm really excited because at the end, I've got a real zinger for you. And I think it is going to help you out. But in order to illustrate this, there's a a story in the Bible. It's in the, the book of 1 Samuel. And it's about a guy named David. Many of us know David. It's King David. It's the guy that, that killed Goliath. David is the guy that would uh, come as a shepherd boy and he, his brothers would go off to fight in a war, and a battle. And then there would be this big guy named Goliath who would intimidate the entire army. And David shows up with some cheese and some butter and bread for his family. He's like, wait a minute, why are you guys afraid of this guy? And they're like, well, he's huge. Look at him. So David goes out and he takes you know, a sling and some rocks and he hits Goliath on the head. And then I think he cuts his head off. And so David conquers Goliath, and then David would be pulled into Saul, who was the king at the time. He would be pulled in, and Saul would kind of accept him like a son. And David would would grow in stature, and he would grow in fame, and people would sing songs about him, and Saul got jealous. And so then Saul tried to kill him. He threw a spear at him, and David, he, he managed to escape. And then David's living out in the wilderness. And while he's living in the wilderness, he's attracting a whole bunch of other people that have also kind of been cast out of their areas. And David ends up with an army. He has his own army of about 600 people. 600 men, actually men, not people, which means there were probably even more people. And so here's this guy that's been promised to be a king who killed Goliath, who rose in popularity, who had the king try and kill him, who is now fleeing and on the run. And then we step into this story here. Now, this is David living in caves, living in the wilderness. David has been treated by a mean person, Saul. Saul was extremely mean to David, so much so that he he tried to kill him with a spear. And David's been on the run. He's been fleeing Saul for so long. And then this situation happens. This is a wonderful thing that we can learn from. So to set the scene for you, in 1 Samuel 25, 2, a certain man... And Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats, three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. So we can go to the next verse. In verse 3, his name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent woman, a beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean. Now, I didn't put the word mean here. The Bible did, so it really aligns with this series that we're doing today. But Nabal was surly and he was mean in his dealings. He was a Calebite. While David was in the wilderness, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So this is why this would be interesting or why this would be attractional to David. Nabal has all these animals. And when the, the way that sheep shearing worked is kind of like investment. So Nabal would not know how rich he was until he sheared all of his sheep. And so now that Nabal is in sheep shearing season... David knows that he's about to find out how rich he is. Nabal knows that he's about to find out how rich he is. And so now the interest is peaked between Nabal and the interest is peaked between David and his men because he's like, hey, we're all about to find out how much money this guy actually has here. And so that, that's why this whole sheep shearing season is so uh, important in our story here. So then we go on to the next verse. So he sent 10 young men. So David says, this guy, this rich guy is about to know how rich he is. So I'm going to send some guys over to him. I'm going to go talk to him. So he sent 10 young men and said to them, go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, long life to you, good health to you in your household and good health to all that is yours. So David's giving this very formal good and encouraging greeting. So he's not coming in saying, I'm going to take everything you have. He's coming in saying, hey, positive message here. Welcome. I'm, I, I hope your family's doing well. Hope everything's good. You know, it's a very formal and, and non-intrusive greeting. It's probably the most uh, inviting and warm way that David and his men could go and greet somebody. 
So that, that, that's, why, that's what's happening here. And so then in verse 7, he says, Now I hear that as sheep shearing time, when your shepherds were with us, so this is, is David, what David told his men to say, when your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. So David is saying, hey, you're about to find out how rich you are. And just remember that nothing happened to your sheep because my men were out in the wilderness keeping guard. So that, that David's like, your part of what you have is because of how great we are and how safe that, that we kept you. And so he says, nothing of theirs was missing. So the next verse, verse 8. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. That he says, hey, if you need proof, just ask them. Therefore, be favorable towards my men since we come at a festive time. It's festive because it's time to find out how much money you have. Since we've come at a festive time, please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. So this is a very gentle way of David saying, you've got a lot, you're about to have a lot more, and I want you to realize that you have a lot more because of me and my men, so maybe if you have some extra, you can pass it down our way. And so in verse 9, the story goes on, and when David's men arrive, they gave Nabal the message in David's name, and then they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited. Now, this is where it gets a bit tricky, because if Nabal really knew David, or really knew what he was dealing with in David, he probably would not have made David wait, because David was not actually a very nice guy. He was a murderer. They went in and they killed everyone in every village. They took all the stuff. They killed women. They killed children. David was aggressive at what he did. He took land. He took villages. He took sheep. He took all this stuff, and so he's there, uh, his men are there, and they're waiting. And finally, Nabal comes out, and in verse 10, he says this, Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? So N Nabal knows who David is because he knows he's Jesse's son. So it's kind of like saying, Who are you? Like, why am I even dealing with David? Who, who are you, you son of Jesse? Sort of like belittling him, making fun of him, degrading him. Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. So he's kind of also calling David a servant. You're a, a misfit. You're an outcast. I know who you are. You come from Jesse. Your name has made its way to me. But you know what? Your name's not worth anything because you're just another one of those guys that's broken away from your master. You've been thrown out of your kingdom. So it's probably not a good thing to say to David. And then in verse 11, here's what happens. He says, Why should I take bread and water and the meat that I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? And then in verse 12, David's men turned away, they turned around, and they went back. And when they arrived, they reported every single word to David. And so now you have David who has had a mean person. Let's recap. Saul has been extremely mean to David. Remember the iron rule? Do unto someone else as someone else has done unto you. So David has had that someone else has done unto him. Saul, Saul has been mean to him, tried to kill him, threw him out of the kingdom, continues to chase him and hunt him. And so Saul's been mean to David. And based on the iron rule, that means that David now has the ability to go and be mean to Nabal. And so David gets all puffed up and he gets all upset about this. And he's like, we have to stick to this iron rule. In fact, I want you all to go put on your iron swords and your iron armor because we're going to go apply the iron rule in brute force to Nabal and his men. So David says to his men, each one of you strap on your sword. So they did. And David strapped his sword on as well. You know what's crazy about that? Whose sword was David carrying? He was carrying Goliath's sword. You know why he's carrying Goliath's sword? Because God provided for David and with a stone, David took down a giant that was holding back an entire army. David is carrying a sword that stands for God's provision. He's carrying a sword that stands for God's favor. David is walking around with a sword strapped to him that stands for the reality that no matter what comes against David, David can stand because he has God to stand with him. And David takes that sword and that promise and in anger, because he had this person that had been mean to him, he redirects that and he picks up the sword of, of honor, the sword of truth, the sword of God's love. And he says, no, this is a sword of iron. 
and it represents the iron rule. And so I'm going to even strap on my sword as well. And about 400 men went up with David. 200 stayed with the supplies. So David has now built his case. He's justified himself. Nabal is going to get what's owed to him. He's going to get what he deserves. And so th this is how it unfolds here. We skip to verse 21. David had just said, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property, which he, he wasn't invited to do, but he was volunteering. So all my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. See, there's that iron rule. He's paid me back evil for good. And then in verse 22, David declares this. He says, May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning. So David's about to make an extremely declarative statement here. And he says, If by morning I leave alive one male who may belong to Nabal, then may God deal with me ever so severely. So David is basically saying, I'm going to go and we are going to kill every single man in Nabal's family and in Nabal's camp, including his two sons. There's not going to be a single male heir left of these people. Now, does this sound like a bit of an overreaction to you? Yes. David has, has been living in this wilderness and it just so happens that Nabal's shepherds weren't, you know, he didn't ask David to guard his men. But because David's there, he's like, hey, you know, I'm entitled to this because we've, we've kept you safe. So you have to, David is completely overreacted here. And so now David is going to go murder every single male in, in the village. Now, you want to talk about repeating cycles here. David, a hurt man who was hurt by Saul, is now taking that hurt because of a mean person. And he is applying it to somebody else. And that's where we, we kind of are going to stop the story of David. And next week we're going to pick up what continues to happen with David and what David should have done. But what I want you to sit with today is I want you to sit with the fact that mean people and what they do to us, because we don't know how to handle them, we don't know what to do with them, we don't know how to handle ourselves when we encounter a mean person, it drives us to do things that are out of control and out of proportion. It drives us to do things that we should never do. It drives us to overreact. And I don't want us to overreact because when we overreact, we're mean to other people. I mean, David is overreacting and every male in a village is going to die. That's extreme. That's an extreme overreaction. So for you, I've got these four cycle-breaking questions. Four questions that you can ask yourself so that you don't do like David has done in this story. And next week, we're going to talk about what David could have done, even if he had applied these four questions. These are good for you to ask yourself. These are also good for you to teach your children. But I want you to think about these this week. So question number one is this. If, if we want to break the cycle, do you want to be even with or be like someone that you don't like? So you ask yourself, do I really want to get even with the lady with the mean dog? Do I really want to be like this lady who has this mean dog and thinks that we shouldn't be in Cape Town? Do I want to be like her? No. I really don't. Do I want to get even? No, I really don't. Is it worth embarrassing my son or my family? No, it's really not. You know, this is a simple question for you to ask is, do I want to be like them? Because when you act like them or you retaliate, you become just like them. Now, the second question for you to ask yourself is, wouldn't you rather be ahead? So relationally, okay, we're talking about relationships here. When you stop trying to get even in your relationship, in your marriage, those of you that, that have been married for a long time, I don't know where Ted and Margaret Myrtle are, but they, they are like Casey and I's marriage icons. I think they've been married 3,200 years or something. Whatever number I put on it, it's probably too low. But they're married and they love each other. And I guarantee you that they know this, that they, could, they would rather get, get ahead relationally by not trying to get even. You know, I watch my wife do this to me all the time. You know, I will have a stress that impacts me and then I'll come home and be a jerk and then she will turn around and choose me. And she'll turn around and say, I choose you and I love you. And I'm like, wow, you are so far ahead 
of, of me and who I am. But you know what else happens when she does that? She drags me ahead out of my situation with her. So do you want to get, wouldn't you rather be ahead rather than being stuck back in the hurt? Wouldn't it be, just be a lot better to, to get ahead relationally? I think the answer to that is yes. But this is going to take some pride or you're going to have to die to some pride. Hello, this is really hard. This is very, very hard to do. But it's worth it. And the third question that you can ask yourself is this. What story do you want to tell? Your life is a story. When you look back on your life, you leave behind you a wake of relationships. If you think of a boat going through the water and there's this wake that comes behind it, those are your relationships. Those are the memories about you. Those are what other people think about you and how they remember you. Those are the stories that you tell. When you think back on your life and you tell the stories of your past, do you want to tell the story that you kicked, that, you know, you kicked a dog or you rejoiced because a lady got arrested? No, nah, it's not a great story. It's not, it's not a great thing that I, that I want to own. And that's just one kind of silly example. But when you think about retaliating and getting mean or mad at somebody or applying the iron rule to somebody, I just want you to pause and think, if I were to turn around and tell this story to somebody else, would it be embarrassing? Would I be embarrassed? And the answer to that, yes, you probably would be embarrassed. So instead of doing that thing, why don't you think about what you want your story to be and then live that out now? So that then the story you tell is a better story, a story that you're proud of, a story that you, makes you like who you are on the inside. And so now the fourth question that I, that I want to ask is, is this, and this is, this is the hard one. So if you've, if you've taken a nap through this, it's okay. But let's, I want you to wake up for this because if you take anything away, this is the thing that I want you to take away. What would it look like? This is a question. What would it look like to return good for evil what would it look like to return good for evil so here, here's what this is this is so hard to do but it is the exact thing that we are supposed to do and here's why it's because there's another rule and this rule is the Jesus rule and the Jesus rule is do good unto others period there is no, as others have done to you, or as you have done, there's, no, 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 there's no, there's nothing else. Do good unto others, period. See, the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us is to go and love your neighbor as Christ loved you. And so based on that, we, we, we are, our calling is to do good unto others, period. See, the Jesus rule is the hardest rule to apply to our lives because it means we let go. It means we let go of hurt. It means we let go of some of the pain. It means we let go and we give people a pass on being mean. It means that we say, no matter how mean this person has been to me, I'm going to at least, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to try and do good unto them. I, I tried this experiment one time where I, I had somebody that was just wreaking havoc on my life. And I said, you know what? I'm going to commit to praying for this person every single day. And man, those prayers were hard. It's so like, Lord Jesus, I pray that you bless this person and give them cancer. That was day one. Get them through chemo, get them, but you know, make them suffer. But 20, 30 days into this prayer, it was, Jesus, my heart is so broken for this person. What can I do for this person? Look how broken they are. This is, this is sad. Because they're, they're a person that you died for, Christ. It's not a person that, that I need to get back at. It's a person that was died for. It's a person that forgiveness was offered to. And see, behind every mean person is a person that Jesus died for. Jesus died for you, even though you've been a mean person. And so don't, wouldn't we rather live in a society, live in a world where we all apply the Jesus rule, where we just do good unto others? And this doesn't mean that you hope for good unto others. It means you actually do good unto others. See, getting even is natural and predictable. But Jesus invites us to do the unpredictable and to do something absolutely extraordinary. So this is your invitation. And this is the last thing I'll say and then we'll close. Your invitation 
It's to do the unpredictable, the thing that the world and society and Twitter and Facebook and everything else tells you you should not do. Jesus says, be unpredictable and do something extraordinary. So you have two options and how to deal with mean people in your life. You can apply the gold and silver, the iron rule, you can apply all those, or you can apply the Jesus rule. And I just, I, I, wanna, I wanna hope to convince you to sway to the Jesus rule because there is an unpredictable, extraordinary amount of love that actually gets returned back on you. So when you feel hurt by somebody, the best way to feel loved by Jesus is to turn around and apply the Jesus rule and do good unto them. And then let this unpredictable, extraordinary thing work itself out in your life. Now, next week, we're gonna finish this topic. We're gonna finish talking about what to do about mean people. Today was so much about what, what, for you, what can you do? It's like we had to come together and we had to understand that we often react in a way that doesn't benefit us in any way. And so I want you to think about this idea, this Jesus rule. What would it look like for you to walk out of here right now at the end of this message, and the first thing you do when you get out of here is you do something good for that person that came to mind when I said, we're gonna talk about mean people today. Now, some of you, I can feel the heat coming from your eyes as you look at me and you say, there's no way that I could do something good for this person, but just what if? Remember, it's unpredictable and it's extraordinary. It's an unpredictable, extraordinary love. You know, my job is to sit up here and have a heart and a passion for the six million people in Cape Town. And how much better would it be if we get the 200 of us in here that say, let's be unpredictably extraordinary and show the love of Jesus for all those people out there. And so I'm gonna close in prayer. And, and as I do this, the, the, the band's gonna enter and they're gonna lead us in another worship song. And I just wanna say that the words of this song, they mean so much, especially as it comes to this message today. And so when they come out and they lead us in worship, I want you to really look at those words and sing those words and think about the meaning of those words. Let that kind of just wash over you and let God talk to you. When we leave here, it gets busy. Life comes, life happens. So let's just take this moment to let this sink in. So Jesus, 